And welcome to another edition of Hank Unplugged, the podcast that brings some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet directly to you. And today is no exception. I am so excited to have Lad Allen with me for this Hank Unplugged episode. Lad is a filmmaker. He founded an incredible organization called Illustra Media, which is a nonprofit corporation that specializes in the production of video documentaries that examines the scientific evidence for intelligent design. These award winning films, they are absolutely incredible. They've been distributed throughout the world and translated into more than 20 languages. Lad Allen had a vision. That vision has touched the lives of people all over the planet. He's one of my favorite people in the world. He's kind of California cool. I used to live in California where he lives, Southern California. He's got, I think, four kids now. He hasn't really... uh, accelerated to where I am with my 12 yet, but he's done pretty good. But he has produced some of the most scintillating, inspiring films on the planet, and I am delighted to have him with me for Hank Unplugged. I want to say one more thing before I bring him live onto the episode. You can go to iTunes, give these podcasts a five-star rating. This gets the podcast in the hands of so many people around the globe. So that's a uh, an action step that you can take as you're listening in. You're going to be grateful that here is another example of an inspiring, informative, inspirational guy that uh, that people need to hear, need to associate with, need to see the resources that he has had the vision to produce. Lad, I am excited to be talking to you again. Hank, what a build-up. I, <laughs> I feel uh, totally inadequate based on that introduction, but I'm thrilled to be talking with you again, too. you got to like that California cool part. <laughs> yeah, I'm as California as you, you can get. I was born in San Diego and grew up there, and that's about actually Chula Vista, which is either, even farther south than San Diego, and, and uh, so that's about as Southern California as you can get. And you have impact. I mean, when you started this, Illustria Media, I don't think you had any idea what was in store. The numbers of people that you have impacted through those films, it just boggles the mind. Yeah, we we started actually last year was our 20th year since we started. Uh, I was with Jerry Harned and Jerry and I still work together after all these years and Jim Adams and uh, the three of us had left our former organization Moody Bible Institute, Moody Institute of Science with tremendous experience, but they got out of the film business and and uh, so we were kind of wondering what we were going to do next and wanted to keep going and and uh, we started working out of our houses with really li- no equipment and, you know, God opened. I could talk for an hour about all the things he did, but God opened a number of doors and, and uh, 20 years later, here we are talking on the phone. Yeah, so you could talk for hours about this, but maybe you ought to say something about it, even if it's not lengthy. I mean, how God moves sovereignly in your life. You just take one step forward, then another step forward, you have vision, you have an idea of where you want to go, and little by little, God directs this moving ship. He does, and, and he brought people into our lives at a time when we were really, we, we kind of had a, a, a general idea of the vision that we wanted to continue with, focusing on biblical apologetics and also intelligent design theory. We We had a general plan, but we we had really no resources financially and and to proceed. So like I said, we set up in our houses and and actually twenty years later we're still working out of our houses. We found out it was a great way to work, not a bad way, and we're still doing that. Uh but he brought people into our lives, Steve Meyer at Discovery Institute and Paul Nelson and you know, we had a distributor in Chicago that helped us, uh Al Nader request our video and and then uh, some very generous donors that believed in what we were doing to kind of get us going. And then most importantly, we had 
really supportive, patient wives. And, I mean, it would never have worked for a week without wives that kind of shared the vision and were willing to put up with setting up film companies in your house, you know, and equipment everywhere and everything else. And so God did, step by step, and opened the door with some opportunities on some films, and one thing led to another. And, and uh, yeah, we, we're humbled and grateful for, for everything he did. It's kind of cool when you mention the wives. I mean, so often it's uh, it's a nice thing to say, but for you, for me, for the people that work with you, we know firsthand the truth of there's always a great woman behind anyone that accomplishes something significant. Absolutely. I, I mean, Joni and I have been married 41 years now, and we met when we were on the staff at Campus Crusade for Christ, and I was making films for them, and and uh, she was working in the administration area, and and she kind of knew, you know, we've been dating for a year, and she kind of had a sense of the craziness of all this, the travel and long hours and everything else. And she'd grown up on a dairy farm and knew all about working hard, and uh, so I'm sure that helped. But, you know, she she was just, she shared the vision. She was incredibly supportive and still is after 41 years, and I, it just wouldn't be possible without her. I want to get into some of the details about the films themselves, but you mentioned the word travel, and to be able to produce the films that you have produced has, of necessity, taken you all over the world. But I find, lad, when I travel all over the world, that it opens my eyes to vistas that sitting in an office or even seeing the same thing on a screen cannot duplicate. I agree. You know, things like just specifically, I made my first trip in 1989. This was before we started Illustra to Mexico to shoot the monarch butterfly migration. And I had no idea. I mean, I'd read about it in magazines and books and seen some pictures. But, you know, I had this opportunity to do this and went down with a couple of guys from the University of Florida and who had been there, and the first time I walked into this colony and saw millions and millions, really, it sounded like Carl Sagan, millions and millions of monarch butterflies, and you could hear the wings flapping, there were so many, it just absolutely took my breath away. And I went down there again when we were doing Metamorphosis, you know, about 18 years later, and it was still wondrous, and, you know, you can read about these things and see them, and I thought, you know, I've seen it with back whales and Pacific salmon and all these things. You, you Books and magazines and photographs can do it no justice. And when you get there, you just go, I mean, God is just doing incre- has done incredible things. So we're very thankful for those opportunities. You mentioned wonderment, and there's this sense in which when we live with light pollution, when we live in the isolation of rooms with television screens, we can lose this sense of wonderment. We can lose this sense of imagination. And what you've done through your films, it seems to me, is open up those vistas again so that you want to go out and explore. So when I saw flight or when I saw metamorphosis, I mean, there's this passion that is aroused within you. I've got to get out into the world and I got to start seeing things that I'm blind to now. There's things that ought to amaze us all around, but we simply, we look past them. You're exactly right. And it makes me feel good to know that you have come to that conclusion because that's the reason we make the films. I mean, we want to bring glory to God. And a huge part of doing that is evoking this sense of wonder, which is really lost in our world. I mean, we're buried looking at our cell phones and, and our smartphones and our tablets, and our eyes, you know, are down, they're low, they're not looking up at what God's made, and, and I, I just, it's a feeling that's lost, and when we set out to make these films, you know, the thing, cinema, video, film is, are great mediums, because you can with the motion and with the ability to the visual medium, you can show people these things in, in spectacular ways. And uh, as we go out, that's what we want to do. We want to evoke a sense of wonder uh, 
in people's hearts and in their imaginations for what's surrounding them. God speaks to us through creation. We see that clearly in Romans 1 especially. It's, you know, God reveals himself to man through the things he's made. He's, he's given us his word. You know, Jesus came to earth for a short time in human form, and he's given us the general revelation of creation to reveal himself to us. And I believe that he's trying to speak to us through what he's made, show us important things about who he is and his character and everything else. So that's what we want to do. You know, I think the genius of what you've been able to do is you don't preach. I mean, when you watch these films, I don't get a sense as though I'm going to get some kind of a trite sermon with three points, but rather I watch these films and when I'm done, uh, well, for example, you watch Metamorphosis. I mentioned that because it is one of my all-time favorites, and that's saying something because I could probably say each one of them is one of my favorites. But you watch a film like Metamorphosis, and you don't really have a sense of what that means until you watch the film. It's just a word to you. Then you watch the film, and when it's all done, there's an implicit knowledge that there is a creator. I mean, if there was ever a doubt as to whether there is a creator, that doubt is settled. And yet, there was no sermon. The majesty of metamorphosis was enough to convince you. Yeah, I, I, I have nothing else to say. You know, what can I add to that? I mean, the, the metamorphosis of a butterfly, or you know, the the grace of a pelican in flight, or the, you know, Pacific salmon pounding its way upstream. I mean, the, the words, there's nothing to say that you can add that can add. If you show it and show it well, then there's really very little you can add other than just sort of maybe explaining what's happening here. But but uh, that's the beauty of this. It's God's revealed himself to us, and no one's with, you know, every, we're without excuse. That's it. What Paul writes in Romans is it's, it's not like, we, well, no missionary ever came to talk to me or I never had a Bible. That's, that can happen, I'm sure, to people. But if you can see and you live in the world, the revelation is there and there's no reason for us to preach in these films. Um, it's to present what's there in a really clear way. And I think that speaks for itself. Yeah, I mean, it's the light of creation. You alluded to it, God's eternal power, his divine nature clearly seen through what has been made so that we are without excuse. I think it's also this sense that God has given us. He's carved a knowledge of himself uh, into the canvas of our consciousness. And therefore, if we respond to the light that he's given us, he will continue to give us more and more light. So it's never the absence of light that damns. It is the spising of light that damns. You not only reach people through the beauty of these films, but I love the people that you have in the films. You alluded to some of them, but I think of Paul Nelson. What I love about Paul Nelson is his manner. I mean, you just can't pay enough for that kind of manner. And I know you, I mean, he does a lot of this stuff just out of the goodness of his heart because he believes so deeply in Illustra Media and what you're doing. But the manner in which he communicates, I think that's a lesson to us all. It's not winning the argument by using a hammer. Uh, it's the grace of Christ that exudes from every poor. Exactly. And I have worked with Paul. I first met him before we started Illustra. I met him in 1996. I did an interview with him out at with Biola University, and I could I knew five minutes into it that if A he was brilliant, he was a first-rate scientist and just a really great thinker. But more than that, and you could just see it in his eyes, he had a an incredible sense of appreciation for the wonder of creation. And he told me once, and this was really interesting. I've never forgotten that influenced me greatly. That you know, he Paul is is the kind of guy that that can have a, a real sensible relationship with people that don't agree with him. I mean, you know, guys that are Darwinists that just think that the idea of design is an enormous threat to their worldview, they can still be friends with him because he's sensible and he can disagree in a way that, that doesn't create enemies. <laughs> you know, he's very open about how he believes, but, 
but he's willing to listen and discuss. And he told me once that he was working with a guy at at the University of Chicago um, who uh, was a, a first-rate scientist and, and an ardent Darwinist. And he took Paul aside once and said to him that, you know, all you guys have to do is show what's going on. You, you don't need to pontificate and argue. Just show what's going on because... That's the most powerful evidence for design there is, and and I, you know, I've never forgotten that. I mean, we're filmmakers. It's like I said before, an incredibly visual medium. Show what's going on in a way that people will not forget it. And so we use cameras that shoot in, you know, ultra slow motion and macro lenses and telephoto lenses, and we also use computer animation. To show things on a molecular level, biologically, that you know cameras can't see, and, but it's still incredibly visual and very powerful, and that's what we've tried to build these films on. The animation—I still remember seeing some of the animations in your films for the first time, and thinking, "Wow!" You look at a a cell back in Darwin's day it would be thought of like a a miniature blob of jello but when you start really looking at the cell and you do such a great job of this with your animation you see that the cell in and of itself is more complex than a city it's got a sewer system it is a system of electricity i mean it's got lights i mean it opens up your eyes on a on a molecular level to the wonders of god how he designed the human body, how he designed the world. And again, you get done watching the films, and one thing is forever dismissed, and that is the idea that everything is a function of just mere molecules in motion, that there's no such thing as a, an intelligent designer. You know that there was design, and that the design presupposes a designer. Exactly. And when Darwin was working on um, Origin of Species, he had no idea, and, and readily admitted that he had no idea what was in, really involved with a cell. He, you know, it was a it was a simple blob of undifferentiated protoplasm, uh, like jello, and had no idea what was going on. And it really wasn't until 1950s when Watson and Crick uh, determined the the structure and the shape of the DNA molecule, and then you know, technology, scanning electron microscopes and these types of things came into being in the 50s and 60s and 70s, got stronger and stronger. And suddenly you really could see what was going on, something of what was going on. A lot of it was still too small. And But the exciting to me about it is that as you get into this on a molecular level, and the guys at Discovery Institute, um, Steve Meyer, Bill Dembski, Mike Behe, all of them, Scott Minnick, Doug Axe, they've, they've just done a wonderful job of this, and Gager, um, of, of showing what is going on inside. And when you get inside, because of the, you know, just the minute, the, the miniature nature of what you're working with, you see these elaborate machinery, uh, rotary motors, and, you know, just, all of these things that are going on in every cell of our bodies. And and you just look at this and and the the element, you know, we can be impressed standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon or looking up into the night sky and it's easier to grasp God's magnificence and power in those situations. But when you start looking on the micro level, there's something about that that is certainly as impressive, maybe even more so because you're working in such a confined space. And and you can't photograph these things do them any justice, so we, we rely heavily on animation to to build this machinery in, in ways that, and even then we're doing it no justice. I mean, it's more complex than what we've ever been able to show, but what we've been able to show is awfully complex and awfully elegant in its design, and people see this, and it's universal, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking or what culture is you know, looking at your film, you get it. You see it. There has to be a creator. There has to be a designer. And and the more we learn, the more science shows us, the more that cameras reveal and science reveals, 
it doesn't get any simpler. It's not like you go, oh, yeah, now, yeah, I could see how natural selection could have done this. No, it gets more and more complex, and natural selection seems more and more unlikely. The more we know, that's what's really exciting about it. It is exciting. And, you know, I've mentioned Metamorphosis a few times, and uh, you obviously have a film called Metamorphosis. And th- there's a sense in which when you say Metamorphosis, you assume that everybody knows what you're talking about. Maybe someone has a rudimentary idea of metamorphosis, caterpillar, butterfly. But what you do in that film is you show that the caterpillar and the butterfly are the same physically, but they're different organizationally. And out of this, this chrysalis, where the constituent parts of the caterpillar devolves into this chrysalis, this casket, as it were, out of that comes a being that is quite different. Again, it's the same physically, but it's different organizationally. So you have the caterpillar with a completely different digestive system than the butterfly. You have, uh, you have a caterpillar that can only crawl along. You have the butterfly that can fly, butterfly. Then you have eyes that change. The caterpillar can only distinguish between light and dark. The butterfly has a field of vision and color acuity that exceeds that of a human being. So you start seeing all of these things and it becomes more than just impressive. It becomes an analogy for what happens when we're resurrected, because when we're resurrected, we're the same physically, we're different organizationally. Then we're going to be imperishable. We're going to be incorruptible. I mean, you think about what happens in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we too are going to be changed like that. So we see what we're going to be in some some veiled way, but in a very emotive, powerful way. We see what we're going to be in resurrection. So there's a mystery that is unlocked that doesn't just wow you, but also gives you a sense of our own future and destiny. God reveals himself to man through the things he's made, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. And, and it's even better for us because we're going to live eternally. Caterpillar, you know, is going to live six, eight weeks unless you're a monarch, then you'll, you might make it six months. But yes, it is a spectacular illustration of what Paul writes about becoming a new creation. You know, old things have passed away, all things have become new. Exactly. And the caterpillar's metamorphosis, and it was what really he kind of drew me to the film. I was drawn to that film for a lot of reasons, but one of them was just this unbelievable transformation that takes place that transforms one life form, a caterpillar, it essentially dies. The caterpillar is dead when it enters the chrysalis. It starts to break down, and all of its constituent parts are rearranged in, you know, eight or nine days. I was raising them in the family room of our house, which, again, goes to my patient wife, and so we could photograph every stage, and you just had to have them there because you didn't know when these things were happening. And we had, for, for six, eight weeks, I had milkweed, which was the only thing the caterpillars would eat, and We'd get up in the morning and we'd see them crawling across the ceiling, <laughs> pull them down and bring them back on the milkweed. And, but to catch this life cycle and to see it from hatching from an egg, about the size of a pinhead, turning into this magnificent winged insect and knowing that, you know, the basic chemistry was the same. I, I still can't. It's just, it's magic. I mean, there's just nothing you can do to explain it. And I've never heard anybody adequately explain how this actually happens. I and mean, we have some general ideas, but it is a spectacular illustration of what God does in our lives. And it's a testimony to God's power, and it's a testimony to what he has in store for us. And yeah, it's one of the, I've worked on a lot of great projects. I think it certainly ranks among my favorites. When you were describing what you were just now describing, I mean, all kinds of images went through my mind, but also I thought about Bill Nye, the science guy, saying I'm a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck among other specks, among still other specks in the middle of a speckless universe. I suck. And so you have a scientist missing the essence, the wonderment, the imagination, the beauty that you just described. Yeah, in fact, it's funny you mentioned that. We're working 
you know, Nye's worldview and it really grew out of, of Carl Sagan and that pale blue dot photograph that that uh, the Voyager 1 took in 1990, looking back at Earth from 3.7 billion miles away from Saturn and, and taking this picture of of the Earth, and it was just a little pixel, one pixel of light. And Sagan looked at it and, you know, came to the real, you know, he just came to the realization, you know, this is where every person that's ever lived has been on this speck of light and we're insignificant compared to the rest of the universe. And, and, and there's no one who's chilling, his final words. We realize that we're alone and there's no one out there that can save us from ourselves, you know, and, and we're, we're doing a short film for a new website based on this, this, this worldview, this materialistic worldview that we are of no significance when compared to the universe. And, and, and then you compare that to what David wrote in the Psalms about God knowing our thoughts before we have them, our words before we say them, knitting us together in our mother's womb. All of these things, we see the intimacy of this relationship we have with the creator of the universe that Bill Nye or Carl Sagan can't see. And, and, and what a joy it is to know that's true. I mean, it changes everything. You know, when you say that, I think the tendency so often is to dismiss a guy like Bill Nye. I mean, he's made a cottage industry out of making fun out of Christians and, and the Christian worldview. And it's so easy to want to be hostile in return, to be able to overwhelm him with facts, to show just how ridiculous his presuppositions are. And there's a sense in which maybe there's righteous indignation because he's dragging so many people into the pit with him. But on the other hand, there's a sense of real sympathy for a person like that so that you don't you, you don't want to hammer him as much as you so desperately want to reach him and those like him. And I think that's really what I sense, not only in your personal makeup, but in the reflection of that makeup in the films themselves. Well, I, I appreciate that because I agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I don't... I, Bill Nye is a really smart guy. Carl Sagan was brilliant. Robert Jastro... I mean, so many of these guys were, were, were brilliant scientists, and yeah, they adapted a worldview that was radically different than my own, and we disagree, but we're all created in God's image, you know, all of us, and God died for everybody, and, and you know, you and I were fortunate enough at some point in our life to be either, in my case, it was a godly grandmother and parents, and, you know, and, and I was nurtured an environment where I was developed an appreciation for a sense of God from the beginning. Man, not everybody has that. And, you know, I look at that, and, you know, there for the grace of God go I. I mean, I, I, my worldview could be very different. And, and so, yeah, you, you just, you want to engage these guys, you want to talk to them, you want to appreciate their intelligence. Stephen Hawking died recently, and, I mean, his worldview was very different than mine. But, boy, what a brilliant mind God gave him, you know, and, and things he saw and, and, and was able to understand and really how close he was, really close to understanding this and in, in terms of God's power and existence. And yeah, it, it's, you, you reach out to the world in ways that you hope will be appealing and, and you hope will, will cause, evoke discussion, honest discussion and openness. That's all you can ask for. And 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 then the spirit of God, you know, can work in anybody's heart and bring them as He has throughout history, and bring them to an understanding of the truth. I love your new project. Uh, there's so many projects I want to talk to you about, but the John Ten Ten project. Uh, I saw a little bit on that project, and I thought, wow, what a great project! Based on one of my favorite verses, I have. Come that they may have life and have life more abundant or have life to the full. And it, it always reminds me that this life is not simply a life that begins when we die. It's a life that we can have now. Meaning yes. that... Yeah, yes, that verse was written to believers alive now. Yeah. It wasn't talking about heaven then. 
is talking about now, you know? From, and so Christ doesn't just come to save us by his death. He saves yeah. us into his life, and that life is an abundant life. Yeah, that's right. And, and abundance doesn't mean you'll be rich or you'll drive big cars or you'll, you know, it, it's not, he's not talking about materialism. In or some, sometimes he blesses us with, with material things, but he's talking there about something much deeper, which, which is, is relational with him. And, and when things go bad, when things go sideways, and you look at all of the apostles, their lives were, were, were safer and easier, probably circumstantially, before they became followers of Jesus than after. They all, died. They all had really rough circumstantial lives after they chose to follow Jesus. But their lives were richer and more abundant than ever before. And so this abundance is all about cultivating this relationship, which is based on understanding of God's Word, understanding of His creation, uh, understanding of His character. You get those elements aligned correctly, you're going to withstand the trial and tribulation that we're all going to face. In our... Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. You're going to guarantee it. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And, and that's what we've devoted this website to. We've taken a lot of our full-length films, broken them down into shorter modules that stand alone that can easily be shared on social media, through Facebook, through email, through Twitter. And just it's just an, and they're free. We're making them available for you don't pay to subscribe. It's all free. It's all there. And we want people to to share our films. We've been grateful that millions of people all over the world have seen our films, but we want hundreds of millions to see them. And we're hoping. And social media people ask me sometimes about you know what it's like to be a filmmaker now. I go well, it's the greatest time. And it's and it's it's the hardest time, and, and, and it's only hard in the sense of, uh, you know, selling DVDs and and selling things has become more difficult because people expect to receive their media for for free or at little cost, and and the good, that's the downside. God takes care of that stuff. The the the, the upside is we have the the tools. You know, you're at, we're doing a podcast now. I mean, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, would you've even thought about this? I mean, you, 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 we have the tools to reach people in ways we never have before, and for people to see your material in it, in ways they've never seen it before, and it really excites me. I mean, the financial resources God can take care of that stuff. The technology He's opened opportunities that are spectacular, and that's why we. We started. We developed this website last year. We're constantly adding to it. We're adding new material all the time, and and we want people to see it. And we want them to share it with the world. So, the passion that you just exuded in the last few moments. I mean, I think people have to get a sense of that as they live out their daily lives, because so often we do something in a day's time, and we say at the end of the day, "I hated what I was doing." And yet we were created to enjoy what we're doing. And when we're doing what God created us to do, then there's peace, even if there are difficult circumstances. And, and I think you're kind of talking all around that. I mean, you're trying to get at that in different yep. ways because you love, you absolutely love what you do. And there's got to be a sense of real deep satisfaction as you think about all of the people that you've been able to impact. And so even if there isn't uh, the monetization of the digital media platforms, you're still finding your real comfort and your encouragement and your joy and your peace in a different place. Absolutely. I mean, I, I am not discouraged that, you know, we went through, I started with 16 millimeter films and we'd make films on 16 millimeter churches would rent them and they'd show them. And then VHS came and that changed everything. So that, that, that rental 16 millimeter died in six months. It was over. VHS came and then VHS is replaced by DVD, which is a, a superior format. Now streaming comes and, and dig, all these digital platforms come and, and it changes. The economics always change. But and and sometimes not at least on the surface for the better, but but that's trivial compared to the number of people you can reach 
every time there's a paradigm shift within the type of media that you're producing and 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 so that i mean that's just so vastly outweighs the the inconvenience perhaps of of well you know we're not going to sell this many dvds or we're not going to you know the standard revenue to, to underwrite these things won't maybe is changing no rejoice because it, there's never been a better time if you're involved in any kind of media, but especially films, to to get the message out to the world. And I mean, I'm talk, working with guys in Norway now. You know, it's a retired surgeon, and he he just wants to get our material in the hands of people there. So he's gonna, you know, and he'll do it through YouTube. And 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 I just look and it's going to be impossible 20 years ago. And we have contacts in China that are. You know, we're we're making we're putting things into YouTube, and you know, and we've had a tremendous success with DVDs over there with Christian people coming in from the mainland to Hong Kong, and Hong Kong Christians giving them gift packages that that have DVDs and Bibles and these kinds of things in it. And you don't make any money doing that, but who cares? I mean, millions of these go into China and into these countries, and on in formats that people can see them in, and that. You know, you're not smuggling them in; they're bringing them in themselves. And some guy on a street corner gets a hold of it and starts replicating them in his house and selling them for a dime on the street corner. I mean, you hear these stories, and and you're just going, "This is, it's." I couldn't make this stuff up, you know. And I do. I turned 68 last month, and somebody asked me, "Well, how much longer are you going to work?" And I go, "Gosh, I hope another 20, 10 or 20 years." You know, I mean, I really like this. I get up in the morning and. Lord willing, you know, I, I, I can't imagine anything that could make me happier here on earth or make my life richer and more abundant. And my wife is still incredibly understanding. And, you know, so we, we just want to keep going. And uh, the technology's there. Uh, the cameras get better. The delivery systems get better. The software to do animation gets better. It It, it just... I don't know, you just can't hope for more. It's great. You ever have any sleepers? I mean, films that you feel committed to make because you think you really have to do this, whether it sells or not, that really surprise you in the end because they all of a sudden they they get a following? Yeah, yeah, it happens. I mean, any time, and you know this when you write a book, or, or, or any creative endeavor, it, it's very subjective, and you have great hope when you start that that it will develop a following, and and that people will see it. I mean, if you if people aren't seeing it, you're just spending a lot of time and money on a very expensive hobby. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with it, but there's very it's not a lot of gratification ultimately if people don't see it. And and yeah, we we've had it, and you go into every film feeling, will it will it develop a following? And sure, films like Unlocking the Mystery of Life that we we kind of had a sense we were we were right on the cutting edge of the intelligent design movement. This was 20 years ago when it was really starting to build. And and Jerry Harnett and I, and if I get out of here without talking about Jerry, you shoot me, okay? <laughs> because we we've been working together since 1984. And that's an eternity every day. And I love him like my brother, and he's incredibly gifted. And we work every day together, and we're still best. Of, he's one of my best friends in the world, and he's a he's a, a real talent. And and I just thank God for him. And every day we pray and hope that people see our films. And 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 um, you know, you do film sometimes. Some will do better than others with unlocking. We knew we were kind of on the cutting edge of the ID movement, but didn't really know how it was going to go. And have just, I still get calls from people all the time that, oh yeah, we saw this film. You know, I didn't realize. You know, this is great. And it film's twenty nineteen years old. Metamorphosis. Yeah, you know, when we started, people are saying, well, who's going to be interested in butterflies, you know, <laughs> other than me, you know, and, and I do, I'll wake up in the middle of the night sometimes going, what are we doing, you know, <laughs> God, am I really doing the right thing here, and and you hope somebody shares your enthusiasm, and it turned out that, yeah, an awful lot of people did, Privileged Planet, you know, some of these films that you just you're continually amazed. That's the other thing about doing films or documentaries. 
about real things that really don't change. You know, cars change, hairstyles change, wardrobes change, you know, but butterflies don't change, you know, and, and eagles don't change, and salmon don't change, and humpback whale, I mean, they're, just, they're, they're just, they're they're like evergreen, and people see a film about them, and the, the wonder of them doesn't, these films don't go out of style or don't go out of date, and because of the subject matter. And so I'm hoping 20 years from now, I'll get people will still be saying, hey, I saw metamorphosis, I saw flight, I saw living waters, you know, really encourage me, and maybe that'll happen. And with, with the digital medium, as long as the Internet exists, this stuff's going to be floating around out there. You know, it's, it doesn't go away unless we take it down. And, and so that's the other thing that's exciting. I mean, I don't have a VHS player anymore. So I can't play my VHS tapes. And DVD players are becoming obsolete, too, you know. But in the digital medium, that stuff's going to be there. And same for books, same everything. And so that's pretty exciting. It is exciting. You know, I could flog myself. You were talking about flight. And when my staff first brought me a DVD of flight, I... I kind of looked at it, I thought, you know what, I love Lad Allen, but my goodness, Flight? And then I watched the DVD, and like I said, I want to flog myself. I thought, oh my goodness, how could I be such an obscurantist? I mean, it was one of the most spectacular things I ever saw. And then I became a flight salesman. I mean, anybody that talked to Hank, oh my goodness. <laughs> you are our biggest, Hank, I thank God for you too, because We've been partnering in this for a long time. I would say back to Unlocking the Mystery of Life, which would have been about oh two, and you have been one of our greatest advocates, and, and part of the reason we're still going after 20 years is because you have, you have promoted and encouraged people to see our films, and, and we, are, we, we will literally be eternally grateful for that. Well, we're going to spend eternity together. We're about the same age, so... Yep. Hopefully we'll get there about the same time. I'm hoping I'll last for a while. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, you know, and, and yeah. But if God said it was done today, I, you know, I, I, I would feel like life had, you know, I'd serve some purpose in my well, you life. Just, you're just getting going. I mean, I think you're well, just I, getting I, going. I hope so. I, I, I feel good, you know. I'm still exercising and eating okay. And, you know, I, I, I don't have a desire not to do this. And uh, I'm working on three films right now, and I'm excited. They're short films, and we're going to release them on the John 1010 Project website starting next month. They're cosmetic kind of follow-ups to Privileged Planet. And, and I'm really excited. You know, I just look at him. I go, "This encourages me." I hope it encourages somebody else. You know, and 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 it's you know, it just gets you going. And and I I I'm thankful for the opportunity. The John Ten Ten Project. You want to get back to that for just a moment? I sure. I saw a little clip of Johnny right. Erickson Tata, right. just one of my heroes of the faith, but. Yep. It was intriguing just to see that little clip that I saw. Here you have someone who, in essence, is like flight, is like metamorphosis. You have someone who's this beautiful woman, great athlete, cut down in the flower of her youth, all of a sudden relegated as a quadriplegic to a wheelchair. I mean, I remember carrying her up with some of our staff into my office when we had her offices in Southern California so she could do the show with me. And, and then recognizing that the beauty of Johnny Erickson Tata is that she's recognized her wheelchair as her crown because as a result of being confined to a wheelchair, she has drunk deeply of God's grace and majesty and knowledge. And now she is blessing millions out of the overflow of what she's consumed. Yeah, you know, I, I've had the privilege of working with her twice and interviewing her twice. And I don't, you know, we talk about John 10.10 and 10 this abundant life. And there are certain things, you know, as Christians, sometimes we can kind of fake it when we're really struggling. Oh, yeah, I'm doing great. Yeah, I was, oh, good, good. And you, you know, you, and you're really not. You can kind of fake your way through it to a degree. When, when you, at 18, become paralyzed from the neck down, and 
and you end up living a life that just radiates joy and peace and gentleness and self-control and wisdom and all of those fruits of the Spirit that you want in your own life, that you desire. This is all I really want. I want to have those things real in my life most of the time, you know, the majority of the time, not the minority of the time, the majority of the time. I look at her and I see that and I go, you can't fake that. That encourages me because I know the Holy, it makes me feel that the Holy Spirit is real, that, that the fruits of the Spirit really are real. It's just not stuff that we talk about and hope for, but it really works because I see it in her life. And, and you know, you sit down for two or three hours and you interview somebody and, and the things that, the wisdom that pours out and the, the personal experience she's had and the honesty and the transparency about it all. And you go, yep, this is real. This is a real thing. This, this spiritual life can be real because it's real in her life and there's no way she can fake that. So just like a Finch's feather points you to a designer, John Erickson yep. Tata yep. points you to a designer. Yep. Yeah. Tell us yeah. a, a little bit about the short films that you're working on right now with this 1010 project. Yeah. Oh, that's intriguing. Well, we got three. It's a trilogy, and and it and it did. It kind of people have been asking us since 2004. You know, well, when you're going to do more space film, you know, like Privileged Planet, and and, and so I, 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 we started, you know, four or five months ago, and. The, there, there are three films, and they're each about six or seven minutes in length. And the, the first one's called Big Big Universe, Bigger God, and it deals with the size of the universe. We take a journey, and it's some of the best animation we've ever done. And you, you leave Earth, and you travel to the end of the known universe at, at the speed of light. And and you, you get a real sense for how magnificent and vast the universe is, and then we... We, we pull it together at the end, and basically, you know, how big is God? Well, he's, he's always going to be beyond comprehension, but we can understand him and we can know him. And then we did it. We did another one called The Agnostic and the Universe. And, and when we were doing Privileged Planet in 2003, I interviewed a guy named Robert Jastrow. Um, he, he wrote a book called God and the Astronomers, which, which was a like 27 printings and and Jastro is is an agnostic um he was he was the head of NASA's Goddard Space Institute he he was the director of the Mount Wilson Observatory which was the, one of the most famous observatories in the world because that's where Edwin Hubble discovered the expanding universe and and or, or proved it was real and 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 we interviewed him, and I went there with the intention of interviewing him about Mount Wilson and Hubble's discoveries. And in the course of the interview, I asked him about his book, God and the Astronomers, and asked him, you know, what motivated him to write this book. And he really opened up, and and he said, "I'm an agnostic. I'm a materialist, but the, the evidence that points to the universe with a beginning that had a beginning is overwhelming." And, and I believe the universe had a beginning, and when you start thinking that way, it, it takes you naturally back to if it hasn't always been there, if it, if it was created out of nothing, then there was a creator. And, and he just, he goes, I'm a, I'm a mess because I'm a materialist, and I, I believe because I've been trained as a materialist that matter and energy are all there is, there is no God, there is no creator. I know that's how I'm supposed to think scientifically. But at the end of the day, I look at the evidence, and it leads me to, it leads me to a creator. And he goes, I'll never, I'll never in my lifetime find the answer. He goes, that's why I wrote the book. In the book, he's got his famous conclusion that scientists will, you know, they'll use to the power of reason, they'll scale all of the great mountain peaks of ignorance, and, and, and they'll solve everything through reason and, and materialistic worldview, and then they'll get to the final peak, and they'll climb over this peak, and they'll see that they, they'll be greeted by a band of theologians who've been there for centuries. You know, basically saying that Genesis 1-1 was right from the beginning, you know, and, and that's what scientists, is old, scientists are ultimately going to discover. And Jastro was one of the last interviews he did. He died a couple of years later, and I've had this interview sitting there for years, really wanting to use it. And so we built a, sh a, sh a short film around this interview, 
and and he's so honest, and you, you just see the struggle that he's willing to acknowledge. Most materialists won't acknowledge the struggle, but he does. And so that's the second one. And then the third film deals with, with Carl Sagan's famous Pale Blue Dot uh, speech that he gave at Cornell University in 1994. And we live, we live on a pinpoint of a planet or you know, in an ordinary, a humdrum universe <laughs> orbiting you know, throughout, a, throughout a, an inconceivably large universe, and, and we're nothing. You know? I mean, we are nothing. We are little points of light and nothing else. And, and, and so those three films will be released over a three-month span, and and they all kind of work together, but I, I just, I'm excited about it. Well, you ought to be excited about it. I mean, it's sort of shades of, uh, you know, privileged planet. And, uh, that's another thing that was was revolutionary. Not only the book, but then the uh, the film that you did. The scientists who are speculating that the Earth, you know, going back to uh, Bill Nye that the Earth is an insignificant speck of soil aimlessly adrift in a meaningless universe. But you have Guillermo Gonzalez and Jay Richards refuting the principle of mediocrity, demonstrating that, that the Earth is singularly privileged and designed for discovery. So you not only have this idea of habitability, but you have discoverability. We're, we're placed in exactly the right spot in our galaxy, well, we could say in the universe, so that we can discover things about our universe. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And, and that's why... You know, that confirms this whole idea that God, you know, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. God is speaking to us. I want to do a, fi- a film related to this, this, this message that the scriptures clearly, clearly tell us that God speaks to us through the things he has made. And I want to do a film that, that looks at the message itself. What is he telling us, you know, about, not just that he exists, but but I think there's there's truths about his character that are important that are also revealed through creation. And and I think it's a message as Christians we just don't we don't pursue. We don't we don't yeah, creation's nice, great, pretty, and then you move on to the real things in life with the problems you face and you and God is screaming to us through the things he's made every day if you're discouraged, if you're afraid, if if you're heartbroken Go outside and and look at a blade of grass or a flower or a squirrel running in the tree, and and that's a reminder to you that I'm here, I'm real, I made these things, and I'm in control. And I think I think there's a powerful message about God, and that He's trying to communicate us to us 24/7. It never stops, and uh, I, I think it's something we overlook. I, very often. You see it in so many ways. I mean, I tell you a little story, lad. I was, uh, a year ago, I was diagnosed with stage four mantle cell lymphoma. Yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing wonderfully well. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm you excited. Sound good. Well, I feel good. And, and you know, what was interesting is I, a year ago, uh, Kathy and my son David and I, we had to go to New York. And so uh, my doctor called me while I was in the cab going from the airport to the hotel. And he was describing the tumors. I had tumors in my neck and in my chest and under my arms and in my shoulders and in my stomach and in my pelvic area. And he's describing the tumors and the sizes of the tumor. And I start all of a sudden going vacant. I'm looking out the cab window and I'm just vacant and uh, I, I hardly can respond to the doctor and I, I, you know, turn off the call, uh, terminate the call and my wife and my son want to know what's going on with you because they, they see this vacant look in my eyes because I'm thinking, you know what, this is all over. Yeah. So I, I end up uh, in the hotel room and we're talking, oh, let's go out to eat. And we find this place to eat called the Lincoln Square Steakhouse, a little ways away from the, the hotel. And, and we're in the steakhouse and we have um, a nice dinner and we're talking about my situation, about my tumors. And right in the midst of the conversation, I get a phone call 
from a friend of mine who's a doctor who I did not realize was a specialist in my particular cancer. And so I go find a little quiet place in the restaurant. I'm talking to him and he says, Hank, I just had dinner last night with a guy that I worked with 15 years ago. He had stage four mantle cell lymphoma. 15 years later, I'm having dinner at his house. He says, you just be fine. Have a bottle of wine and just chill out. So fast forward to this last weekend. Um, I guess it was Sunday night. Uh, I've spent a week hanging out with Lauren Green, who's the chief religion correspondent for Fox News, and her husband, Ted, uh, and, and some of my kids at a, at a house in the Hamptons. We've been uh, having a great time together, and we're traveling back from there, and as we're going back, we have to get a hotel because we're going to fly out in the morning. And I decide, let's go back to that same steakhouse. So we went back to that same steakhouse, and I'm thinking, why am I going to a steakhouse? I'm, I'm on a uh, Lenten fast. I can't eat steak. But anyway, we're going back to that same steakhouse because I just feel this sense of going back to the same steakhouse. I go back to the same steakhouse, and we are given a table right across from the table we had, and we all noted that. I said, you know, that's, that's a table we sat at last time. It's right next to us, you know, and we actually kind of wished we were at the table that we were at last time. But anyway, so we're, we eat dinner, and... Dinner is finished, and the waiter comes up to us, and he says, look, I've got some after-dinner drinks that the owner wants to give you complimentary. And then these people start coming out with trays of desserts, and in the middle of these desserts is a big chocolate souffle, and on the chocolate souffle, the words, remission accomplished. Remission accomplished. And then the owner of the restaurant comes out and somehow or other, he had overheard the conversation when we were in there a year ago. He comes out and he says, we're just so happy you're here. You know, last time you were here, you're sitting right at that table. He remembered the table we were sitting at. But all of that long story to tell you that here you have an example of God's finger where you see that God has not forgotten you. God is still speaking to you. He's still intimately involved in every detail of your lives. And it's those little serendipitous, I mean, that's not little, but those moments that let us see that there's a God who not only designs, but he's intimately involved in the minutia of our lives. Down to the cell, right, in your fingertip. I mean, exactly. We are so far from being hopelessly lost in a cold, dark universe. <laughs> you know, at, yeah. Well, you know, when you were talking about the squirrels, when you're talking about the squirrels, I mean, that's what I was thinking about. You go out there, you're overwhelmed with the details of your life and all the, mm-hmm. you know, all the challenges and so forth, and go out and whatever you said, go out and see the squirrel. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. You said a lot better yeah. than I could say. But you, you go out and see, you see nature, and all of a sudden you realize, yeah, I mean, there is a God. He cares for the details of my lives. And that's what really caused me to share that personal yeah, story well, because it's another example of God being involved in the, the details of your life. It's a key to, I'm convinced, I mean, I, and Hank, I have in no way mastered this. I mean, I've been a Christian most of my life, and I'm, I, I get frustrated with myself at times that, I, that my, my faith can be weak or I, I'm not experiencing the joy of, of the Spirit of God as much as I should be, and and yet you get glimpses of it, and you know it's real, and you go, that's what I want. I mean, I, I, I want that kind of life that no matter what life throws at me, no matter how bad the trial or the test or the disappointment is, I'm still going to feel the joy and peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And that's it. I mean, that's what life on earth is about, I think. You know, heaven, that's a whole different deal. But... But that's why we're here, to somehow experience what God has has made available to us. And no, it's not easy, and the tests are hard, and the discouragement is unrelenting at times. But when you do experience it, that's when you know it's real, and that make it's a lifelong process. And I, I don't get as mad at myself now that I didn't. Get, it all didn't come together the first year after I became a Christian. I mean it. It's a process, but it's a process worth pursuing. And 
you know, when we started this website, I mean, that was the feeling. If we could kind of take some of the stuff God allowed us to do and to document people we talked to and just share it in ways that people may not watch an hour or an hour and a half or have time to in any one sitting, but share it in shorter doses and shorter packages that maybe encourage somebody, maybe give you, maybe Johnny Erickson Toddy, you can sit in there and, and get a glimpse of what she's been through and what she's learned and go, yeah, that, there's no reason that can't apply to me. And so now the longer I'm at this and the longer God gives me the grace to be involved in it, you know, the more special it becomes and more thankful for it. You know, you said something just a moment ago that really caught my attention, and I, I think it's worth exploring for uh, the people that are listening into our conversation. Um, I don't know how to get at this exactly, but you and I have been living the Christian life for a long period of time, mm-hmm. and a lot of people will look at you as a giant or me as a giant <laughs> in the Christian faith. Yeah. Okay. I mean, their perceptions can be wrong, but I mean, yeah, they still right. look at you. I mean, look at look at what you've done. You've touched the lives of millions yeah. of people. But you and I still struggle with all of the persistent problems that everyone struggles with. Yeah. In other words, you can put yeah. you can put people up on pedestals, but we all struggle. So you know, in organizations, I mean, I've been president of Christian Research Institute for over thirty years, and. You know, you, you've seen God's finger in your life over and over again. Sometimes the finances are lagging, and then you start wondering, what are we going to do? And then God supplies, and he does it year after year after year. And then 30 years later, you have another problem, and you think, God, are you going to do it again? Right. He's been faithful right. for 30 years, and we're still doubting whether he's going to be faithful next year. I mean, it's it's absurd to think that way, but yet we have those momentary lapses ourselves. Yeah, and unfortunately, they aren't momentary all the time. Sometimes they're longer than moments. You're absolutely right, and I think this is the... It's a marathon. I mean, um, it's it's not Hussein Bolt running 100 meters in the Olympics in, you know, nine-plus seconds, and it's it's done. It's a marathon. It's it And, and you, you start, you accept the Lord, and you... You know, you, you you enter his family and and feel his grace, but it's going to be three steps forward, two steps back, very often throughout your life, and 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 the race, and, and even a marathon comes to an end. Ours won't come to an end until we, we enter heaven. This this struggle, this dealing with disappointment, and fear, and doubt, and pain. We had a young man in our church. Three weeks ago, 27 years old. I mean, as godly a young man as I have ever known. I've known him since he was 11. And his dream was to become a missionary and a pastor. Wonderful parents. He's driving to church to teach Sunday school. He teaches kids Sunday school. And a car runs a red light at 60 miles an hour, hits him broadside, and he's dead immediately. And I I walk I'm walking out of my car, and the pastor is a, a dear friend. I'd seen him ahead of me talking to somebody, and it turned out it was a deputy sheriff. And getting the news, and he walked up to me, and his face was just white. And he goes, "Lad," he goes, "Sam's dead." And and I I I don't even know what to do with this. I mean, I I I can't even you know. And the funeral was. Two weeks ago, and there were 500 people in a church that probably holds 250, and 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 they were all there for the same reason because this young man's life had touched us so deeply, and 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 you're going, why God, you know? And you you can think of every bad thought and every disappointment, every element of disappointment, and fear, and just being upset about the whole thing, but. Life is filled with that kind of stuff that won't make a bit of sense this side of heaven, a lot of it. Charles Swindoll, what did he say once, that the most prevalent sound we'll hear in heaven is, aha, Mm. right? (laughs) When all of these things that happen that we didn't understand, maybe we'll see them and we'll understand them and it will all make sense because it didn't on earth. But that's part of the process, part of the race, part of the fight. And, and part of the, the growth that God wants us to experience, and a lot of it doesn't make sense. And your cancer makes no sense to me, 
my wife went through cancer. It made no sense to me at the time, you know. And and yet God has a purpose and a plan, and these things are going to be part of our lives. So how do we experience peace and joy? They're not going to go away. They're going to be there. So how do we experience it? Well, through the, somehow through the Spirit of God, that's the miracle of it that we do. And that's, I'm, I'm learning that every single day in my life, and I'm struggling with it. I know it to be true. And and I believe at times, believe it, I mean, I experience it, I know it's true. It's just learning to appropriate it, call on it, know it's real. And uh, so, yeah, it's an adventure. It is an adventure. And uh, you, know, you go back to those pillars and posts, I often talk about uh, apologetics, uh, we're involved in apologetics. Is Apologetics is the, the handmaiden to evangelism. And it's not only pre-evangelism in the sense that God uses your well-reasoned answer or your films in this case as a way to open people's minds to receiving the gospel, but it's also post-evangelism. Those people like you and I who've walked with the Lord for many, many years, you can go back to those pillars and posts. When the, the winds and waves of doubt crash upon the house of your faith, you can go back to those pillars Impose. God created the universe. I mean, that's absolutely evident in all of your films. God created the universe. There's no other possibility than the unmoved mover created this universe. And then uh, you, you know that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I mean, this is something that is not something believed through blind faith, but rather faith in evidence. And then we know that the Bible is is divine as opposed to being merely human in origin. So you go back to those pillars and posts and you can cling to them. So in the midst of getting a cancer diagnosis, you can say, I don't understand this, doesn't make any sense to me, but I know God created the universe. I know Jesus Christ is God. And I know the Bible is authority that is reliable, that corresponds to reality. And and in that vein, you actually touch on the prophecies of the passion, um, an extraordinary look at messianic prophecies fulfilled in the final week of the life of our Lord on earth. So you have the Gospels clearly describing the betrayal of Christ, the arrest of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. But in the end, through all of the passion, you realize this was foretold so that we might believe that this is, in fact, God in human flesh. Yeah, it's so powerful. We did that film in 2005, shortly after, right after the Passion of the Christ. I was sitting in church, and I'd seen that the Passion of Christ, and I don't know. It's just one of those things. That I wasn't looking for something. It just, it. I I wrote down the word passion and then prophecy, and I thought, oh my, you know, this is what wasn't touched on in the film so much, and the prophecies, the messianic prophecies, and I do a bit about it through my time at Campus Crusade and Josh McDowell especially, and and, and some others, and and I thought this is the, this is some compelling evidence because. You know, David and, and Isaiah are writing about this stuff centuries before it ever occurs in minute detail, and it all comes to pass in one week, you know, and you're going, gosh, I mean, this is this is an apologetic that's really powerful. And and that's you know, we've broken it down into modules and we put we put them on we've broken a long film down into a short one, but you're right. This stuff can encourage us. You, you, you're so right about when we struggle, you look for the pillars and the posts and the anchors and the things that can you know to be true, that can get you through things that you don't understand at all and you don't have any reasonable answer for. And, and that, I think, is the great purpose of a—I mean, two purposes, to—, to to share with those who aren't of faith reasons to believe, reasons that this is true, but it doesn't end there. They're there throughout the rest of our lives to grab onto and say, okay, we know that to be true, then this stuff I don't understand. I can, I can, I can hang on through it, weather the storm, because God's in control of it. 
he's ineffable on the one hand he's completely unknowable and on the yeah. other hand he's knowable in the personal work of Jesus Christ, so he's condescended to reveal himself to us. You know, I was thinking about one of the great productions that you've done at Illustria Media, King of Creation, and I have in front of me a statement that Johnny Erickson Tata made with respect to this. She said, in our busy world, we, we rarely take time to stop and smell the roses, and yet it is through the discipline of observing creation that we fully comprehend the creative genius of the Almighty. King of Creation is a captivating DVD which gives you the opportunity to be once again utterly astounded by the beauty of creation and the wonder of his word. All so that you might glorify the one who designed it for your delight and for your praise. Take a pause in your busy life and be blessed by watching King of Creation. Now, that ought to be enough to make everybody want to watch <laughs> King of Creation. But, oh, I mean, my. so you'd take her advice and you'd do it. What, what, yeah, what are you going to see? Yeah, in fact, I still watch it. We put and, and we put it up again in modules on the John 1010 Project website, www.john1010.com. Uh, we broke it into pieces, and I get I get emails and I get calls from people that you know you'll watch it like it's it's six or seven modules, and you'll watch one as a devotion. I, I still do. I'll take it out and I'll watch it in the morning. I'll watch for three or four minutes, and and they're kind of self-contained modules, and and uh, it just it reminds me again of the glory of creation and the glory of God's word, and combined with great music of the faith, and and all of these things are meant to to just. With God is unknowable fully. I mean, uncom- beyond our comprehension, but He is knowable in in ways that are really important, and that's the great wonder of it all. So, yeah, that film was another joy to just take all of this material that we had photographed over the years from many films, and then bring it together into a, a devotional film. Uh, the script is a it's a hundred percent scripture. And, uh, yeah, it was a blessing to work on. Yeah, so I would say that you have left a repository of work that is going to continue touching millions of lives. But I think, Lad, as I alluded to earlier on, I think you've only just begun. Uh, I, I mean, the thing that I love about you is that you always have something in the pipeline. I mean, your fertile <laughs> mind never stops imagining working on new projects and I'm always so I, I always can't I can't wait until Illustra Media produces something new. I just can't wait. Well, again, it's it's not a burden, it's a joy. And I've been reading the biography of Michelangelo Bunarati, right? With more creativity in the tip of his little finger than I could ever hope to have in my life, you know, and 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 he worked until the day he died, and he died at 90. He was designing uh, St. Peter's Cathedral he, at, at, when he was 90. And, and it was like he worked because and he, he found his greatest joy, and, and he wanted his work through everything he did, statues, paintings, Sistine Chapel, everything. He wanted it to reflect the glory of God. He believed God had given him these talents and abilities and it's what brought him joy. And and he did it till he was 90. I got a ways to go there, and I don't know if my wife will let me go that long, if she's that patient. But but as I read it, as I read, I've read the book, it's like, it's like, my word, this is encouraging. This guy found, he found real joy in his work that he believed God gave to him and gave him the talent to do. And this is the greatest, probably the greatest, creative talent that you know and at least in terms of art that that has ever lived and and they, but he found you just read it and you see the joy he would just work tirelessly he didn't care about the hours or anything else it just he just found joy in the work and and i think that that's a gift when you find that joy in it and uh, so i'd like to do this as lord willing that's that and I think and Jerry feels the same way, and and uh, we work we work with a lot of freelance guys that we've worked with for a long time that are, 
you know, it's just a joy to work with and, again, have a chance to work with people like you that, that, that makes, makes the work a blessing. Well, you know, when you mentioned the Sistine Chapel, I thought, well, that's a good analogy to kind of close off this podcast, because when you think of the Sistine Chapel, it it has had some repairs over the years. And one of the things that the craftsmen have noticed when they repair the Sistine Chapel, when they repair that dome, they recognize that the workmanship on the other side Hmm. is as elegant as what you can see as an observer. And the reason for that is those craftsmen were working for an audience of one. They were doing what they did for the eyes of God. And quite frankly, that's what I see in your work. I see that what you do is for the eyes of God. Now, God has used this to touch the lives of so many people, but I see that you really care about your projects. This is not about merchandising, but this is about exploring and using the gift that God has given you and in the process blessing millions. Well, that, again, I'm, I'm humbled just by your praise and, and we do care. We, you know, we do care. We want to do the best we can. I mean, it's never perfect and there are always things you wish you could do differently, but I, I believe that, that God's given us this opportunity and we, we, want to do, and we want to do justice in as best we can to what he has done and what he has made and and so yeah it's we're, we're doing everything we can we're throwing everything we got at it and and i that makes that makes it special too you you've also been working with some very special people at discovery yeah. institute a little shout out from your perspective on how how great that organization is yeah again we we only have two full-time Employ. We laugh when we, we, people come to see Illustra Media. It's a ten by ten foot spare bedroom in Jerry Harned's house, who his wife has graciously put up with for over twenty one or twenty one years now. Of you cannot mean that. You cannot the, mean that. Direct in the family room of my house, and and you can't and mean that. We work with a network of freelance people: uh, Tim Eaton, a sim- brilliant cinematographer in San Red- in uh, Santa Barbara. Joseph Gandilas, our animator, Mark Mark Lewis, who who writes all of our, our original music scores. Uh, there have just been people at Discovery Institute, Paul Nelson, Steve Meyer, and Gager, and on and on and on that that have uh, Tim Standish with Geoscience Institute. I mean, it, it, these guys have just and, and women have just helped us in in unbelievable ways. And then Jim Jim Adams, who was with us when we started. And, and it was just real instrumental. Tim's retired now, but it was just incredibly instrumental in what we're doing. And great board of directors, Jack Dabner, Larry Frenzel, so many guys that have just stood with us all the way. And, and um, we're, we're really blessed and thankful for them. I can't leave you on that note. I mean, you're telling me, I mean, you can't mean what you just, obviously you do. But, I mean, I get this picture of, what has been accomplished just through our ministry in terms of the impact on the lives of people. I mean, I've seen the testimonies, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of testimonies as a result. Of it. And you're saying all of this takes place in a bedroom? Yeah, we. it's 10 by 10. It's not even a big bedroom, but the technology, we used to work in a big facility, <laughs> tens of thousands of square feet, it was, but it was film. And now with the digital it's just we got a bunch of computers and monitors all crammed into this bedroom and and so we we edit at Jerry's house and and then we do the audio mixing with a guy named Michael Boddicker who's just he's got a facility in Encino with the final audio mixing there and he's a brilliant talent in his own right but we do all of the editing in a 10 by 10 foot bedroom and then I I've got a corner in my family room with a computer and I write and produce from here, and and then we have freelance guys all over the country, from North Carolina to Oregon. Dennis Burkhart, cinematographer in Oregon, Joseph, our animators, and in North Carolina, close to you, he's in Hickory, North Carolina, and he works. Joseph works in his basement. He's all set up in his basement, and all of our the, the majority of our animation through the years has been produced in Hickory, North Carolina, in a basement. And and it's because the technology is is so spectacular, 
that you can do these things in limited space. And we did it out of necessity at first because we didn't have any money. And we found out this is a great way to work, and it does keep overhead down, so we can put more into the productions. And and uh, I can get up at four in the morning if I want to, and walk out and just start working, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, don't have to drive anywhere. And and uh, so it's that makes it even more special because you look at it and you go, this is foolish, you know, this is this contradicts the wisdom of the world, but then it makes you feel more than ever that God's in it, and and uh, it just. It, it does. You just laugh sometimes, going, "If people only knew," <laughs> you know. And and I, I'm I'm happy to share it. I mean, you know, it's to God be the glory. And uh, so it's that's a luster media. Well, only from the perspective of eternity will you fully know how many lives you have touched <laughs> all over the planet. I mean, you got a little glimpse of it now, but in eternity, I think you have a full appreciation of how incredible the work God has led you to do is and how incredible it has been that God has brought you such a great team. And i got to thank you from the bottom of my heart as well. You've been very gracious towards me. But but I want to thank you for when I joined an Orthodox church, you didn't, you didn't walk away from me. You, you said something very, very kind to me. You knew that I didn't go off half-cocked. And, you know, I, I appreciate your friendship and your support. Oh, we're, we're just... You're the best. I mean, I, I don't care if you're going to church on the moon. <laughs> I know we know we know you, and we know your faith. And regardless of where God has led you or how He's led you, He's led you. And and praise God. I mean, I I am I I know you. I know your heart, and uh, it's just great. And I I. I before we close here, if, I, if I'm shouting out to people, I also want, if any of our donors are listening out there, I want to shout out to you too, because we're a nonprofit organization, and your gifts keep us going. And, and praise God for you. Thank you so much. Well, lad, I, I loved having you on this Hank Unplugged podcast, and uh, I love you, your family, your work, and uh, I'm going to be praying that you're around till you're 90. Hey, you too, and, and let's do this again. This is fun. There's no commercial interruptions or anything. We can just kind of talk. Hey, um, yeah, call, call back in six months, and we'll talk some more. This is great. I loved it. God bless you, my friend. Okay, thank you, Hank, very much. Yeah, you got it. And uh, for everybody listening in, you can take an action step, which is to make sure people in South America, people in, in Asia people in Russia, people in Greenland, in Australia, people all over the world hear this podcast. And you have a direct impact in making that happen by simply going to iTunes and giving us a five-star rating. And so many people are doing that because these are five-star podcasts. I mean, the people that I'm bringing you are truly the most extraordinary people on the planet. You just heard an example of a man who has a passion, had a vision, had a dream, and he's carrying out that dream. And lo and behold, I didn't even know this myself. He's doing this in a very limited capacity in terms of the space that's necessary to pull all this off. Obviously, he's having to travel all over the world and so forth. And he's got associates all over the world. But a small space, and yet he is making a difference. And I hope that stimulates you as you think about how God can use you. You know, it's not always the flashes that uh, make the biggest difference for eternity. So remember, God can use you in a small way. Just give us a five-star rating. I mean, if you don't feel like this is a five-star podcast, don't do it. But I mean, if you feel like it is, you can take an action step and make a difference to bring the most inspiring, informative, incredible, interesting people on the planet in conversational format to wherever you're listening to your podcast. So thanks for tuning in to Hank Unplugged. Look forward to seeing you next time with another episode.